I believe we're ready to start. Um, since I know many of you, I don't mind confessing that three quarters of an hour I was in bed. Um, uh, and I can explain all this. Uh, really. uh, it happened this way. Whenever, whenever um, particularly, I'm not saying this to flatter the broader historical society, but whenever a particularly interesting thing looms up and someone tells me I've got to do something about it, uh, to safeguard myself, because I have got rather sloppy habits in some respects, I usually say, now will you remind me the day before? And uh, in this case, I, um, when Mrs. Taylor told me all this, I said, now will you remind me the day before? And Mrs. Taylor, no doubt believing that I had such a methodical mind that I wouldn't need reminding, <laughs> somehow forgot. So I was reclining my bed about three quarters of an hour ago and the phone rang. <laughs> and uh, I, I learned I was going to um, do this talk. Now the um, position is that I'm, I haven't prepared anything on the history of the trans sky, but I think I could tell you possibly some interesting things about it. The, um, I, when I said earlier that I really wanted to remember this date because of the Border Historical Society, it's true because I've got a great deal of time for the society. It's one of those things which I always feel I should join if we get around to joining. Um, and naturally too because I, I'm always glad when Mark Taylor or DJ J. Pretorius or someone tells me that they've identified another old sort of marker stone here, um, uh, drift. Um, what's, what's that place called near Jamestown? Uh, line, line drift, eh? yeah. because um, my, um, my paternal ancestor came out of the 1820 settlers, and, um, which was British, as you know, <laughs> and the maternal side came out shortly after from Ireland, which led to an explosive mixture. If you look up the list, you'll see one Frederick Woods pitched up on one of those ships at the age of 21. Well, that was the, uh, the chap who started the whole thing going in this country. Um, as far as the trans guy is concerned, having been born there, I'm afraid I've never been particularly strong on history of any kind. Geography I've always loved, but uh, I can tell you where any place is, I can't always tell you what happened there. But uh, as far as the trans guy is concerned, I do know this much that the, uh, my, the thing that interests me most is not so much when they got there and what they did, but even to this day you'll find that they, they have a distinctive way of talking. And this is fairly common to the whole border area. Uh, not always noticed by people who live here all the time, but you notice it particularly when you go away and come back and here are these little nuances of accent, which are common to the border and particularly to the trans sky. Now, there are two kinds of, of accents that I've noticed uh, in the trans sky. The one which we call the, well, I won't tell you what we call it in Corsa, but it's, uh, it, it's common to the, the traders and their families who live in very remote areas. Now, I can only assume that these are chaps who sort of severed all ties with civilization many generations ago, and they've sort of forgotten how to speak the language. And uh, some of these, you find some of them down in Bombana land, and they all speak very slowly. They say things like, I'm a member of the Border Historical Society, Yonk. And the, the, uh, the rest of them speak a little bit faster, but they've all got an accent common to the, the Eastern Cape. Uh, you notice this particularly in Parliament when you hear all the, the Border MPs speaking in the House. And I'm sure when I mention these things, some of you will realize that the... Um, um, people, especially the older people in this area, never speak of the European. It's always the European. And uh, <laughs> the European. And uh, another thing is going. He's going to so and so. He's not going. He's going. And uh, what are you going to do about it? There are a few other things. The word W-E-R-E, -E, were. They seem to say where for were. My mother's one. I, I never tell her about it because I don't want her to stop it. It amuses me. But uh, she says, we were, going, we were going to go there, but we decided not to. But uh, in, in Parliament, I know, particularly Mr. Tom Barker and Mr. Miles Warren, all they make impassioned speeches on behalf of the European. The European mustn't be deprived of this or that. And we were going to introduce legislation to protect the European, and now these corridors driving uh, wages and things uh, against them. Well, uh, I haven't really touched on history <laughs> so far, but um, uh, I do know that, that uh, people like my father and the fathers before them cross over that Cairo uh, to look for work, really. And uh, many of them were working uh, transport riders and other ox wagon chores, and they decided there was some cash to be made across the river, and they went over there. And um, the first thing they had to do was to learn the language. My grandfather, Lawler, actually, who, my great-grandfather, Kelly, who, uh, who was from the Irish side of things, became one of the best Corsa linguists in the territory, and uh, he kicked things off down at uh, Madwalini area, which is Courtney Latimer knows quite well. 
and uh, he um, started, he was one of the first traders in the area, and the pattern of trading stations evolved till today we have one every three miles in any given direction. The, uh, shall we say the Englishman, because in that, in that area there's a lot of wild Irishmen, the Englishman arrived a little later, uh, people like my paternal uh, ancestors, uh, coming from Peddy and Graham Sound in those areas, where no doubt they'd made a hash up of uh, trying to farm. And uh, they followed these Irishmen down there, and in time became as proficient in the language and, and, and trading as the Irishmen. In fact, they did so much better that uh, they've held on to many of their stations to now, to a point now where many of the Irishmen have got rid of theirs. But uh, one of the features of this rough frontier life um, is the similarity between, you know, we see many Wild West films, and uh, no doubt a lot of it's exaggerated. Um, for instance, the cowboys never drew pistols. I believe they used to shoot at each other with sawn-off shotguns. And there was no thing about waiting for the chap to draw first. You, you just waited for him around the corner and shot him. Well, it was uh, not quite that bad in the Elliotdale area of Bourbon land, but it was pretty close. I remember as a child um, hearing the most hair-raising stories of when the Sharpie boys used to ride into town, you know. <laughs> it sounded very much like those early Wild West films. And um, I also remember witnessing some very gory uh, brawls between the, uh, the Irish uh, members of my own family, I regret to say. But it seems to indicate that they certainly uh, kept touch with the pugilistic elements they'd inherited from Ireland or learnt there. And uh, I visited Ireland some years ago and I decided to look up where these chaps had all come from. And I knew some had come from Cork and some had come from Dublin. Now the Dublin crowd were Lawlers and Kellys and you'll find hundreds of those in the Transcar. They propagate madly. Uh, I got to Dublin and uh, I, I said, um, uh, uh, this, this incident is some interesting, probably some interesting uh, sort of race psychology here because I suppose they find they're in such a minority there that the only way they can keep up is to spread the species a bit, you know. Um, I got to Dublin and I looked up all the Kellys and Lawlers in the phone book and I found something like 78 Kellys and about 52 Lawlers. And the name Woods, which uh, from my family came from England, I found something like 90 in Dublin, <laughs> which uh, made the whole thing seem a bit cockeyed. One thing interesting I did notice, I'm digressing, I know again, I've got to say something, is that um, the, the features of the Irish woman in the southern part of Ireland, every one of those women looked like my mother, uh, up to a point, you know, the same type of features. And um, it, it's only when I got back that I looked at my mother and realized you've got very Irish features, which is some, some, uh, some going after something like four generations. Anyway. Uh, when they got over there, they were still in the ox wagon stage and sort of horse riding and the rest of it. Um, and the, the era of the car hit them. Now, even today, the, uh, <laughs> to drive a car down there is, as Ms. Courtney Latimer will tell you, quite a hazardous business, even in the century, because um, you've got to be quite skillful to miss potholes and things. What it was like in those days, I don't know. I do know that a race was staged between, uh, here's a touch of history now, <laughs> a race was staged between um, a Dr. Soga and a Mr. Wilde, way before the turn of the century. Uh, you know, when the first cars were out, there was long steering wheels and gauntlets all over the place, and, uh, and, and the Dr. Soga on his horse, and they raced from Elitel to Tocha and uh, the horse only beat this car by about half a mile or so, which is reckoned quite an achievement. Um, now, I was speaking some months ago uh, to the late Mr. Tom Kenyon, who died recently, and he was writing a history of the Bunga. And uh, I went to look at these notes, and he's very kindly left me these notes. And among these notes are accounts of ventures which I don't know if the Border Historical Society knows about. I should assume you do. But um, there's one there which captured my imagination straight away. It's, um, it's uh, an account of uh, a sailing from somewhere up near Kohama. A trader sailed a, sorry, <laughs> and so sailed a, a boat made from tree, uh, chopped by, have you heard of this one? Uh, I can give it to you sometime if you're interested. Um, these uh, tribesmen chopped this huge tree down, carved a sort of, must have been like one of those Viking ships, I think, because it must have been a huge thing, and uh, it was just a sort of shell of a tree. And he sailed this thing from, from uh, Skohamath or Banyalamath or somewhere to near East London. Now, I thought ridiculous. We would have all heard about that. But um, 
Mr. Tom Kenyon has documented this thing, and he's cited where he's got it from, and I'll be very glad to make it available to you, because I certainly have never heard the story before. It seems to me an amazing feat of navigation, especially in a craft like that. Quite equal to anything the Phoenicians got up to. Um, he's also set out in these uh, notes, which when I've gone through them, I'd like to, to present to you people, because I think you can make the most of them. Uh, as you know, you know, he was called the father of the Bunga, but the, the Bunga history uh, definitely is not only a history of the actual building and the institution, it deals with the people who were involved with it, the, um, the thoughts that were floating around at that time, the various personalities like French Trollope, who you may have heard of, uh, and much of the early development of the trans guy, which frankly I, having lived there, had never heard about. And uh, this man, uh, uh, through something like 80 years, has collected all these little items. Unfortunately, a short while ago, the, um, the museum they had up there, which I'm, I'm afraid to say I never went to see, um, was dismantled. I don't know what they've done with the, the exhibits in it, but it's given way to some new government building, or that, which I feel is, is a, a great pity because there was much there, uh, maybe that they didn't have in the hall, but um, that they were collecting. I know various uncles and cousins of mine were donating to them um, cupboards and, and cabinets uh, which were taken off a ship, which again I don't know the name of, which was wrecked at Klocha Mouth um, oh, many, many years back. And um, the only thing I know about the ship is that uh, up to about eight years ago, this huge wheel, um, steering wheel of this thing was still rusted in the rocks. And uh, my grandfather got off the cup, beautiful woodwork, you know, huge, sort of like a Welsh dress, various other cabinets. And um, these were his furniture in his seaside camp. And all that stuff was to be presented to, to the Antarctic Museum, and uh, including huge beam, or many feet long, and quite an extraordinary beam, you know, uh, which either came off this ship or some sort of ship that was wrecked there. But you know, when you think about it, there, with all the shipwrecks we've had here, Mr. Driffield, I think, has noted everyone assiduously, um, with all the ships wrecked here, there, there, there must have been an awful lot of ships wrecked up there too. And I often wonder if that isn't where the Wild Coast uh, name came from, because um, it's not all that far away, and there any ship wrecked would have uh, less chance of being annotated or noted down or recorded than any along these parts. And I certainly know from my family's point of view, they've often spoken of um, old, old tribesmen who spoke with their father sometime, there was a ship wrecked down at Mpenzu or something, and they got all sorts of things of it. And I've often thought, well, there must be dozens of these things that we've never heard about that, that have uh, gone aground off the wild coast. Um, it'd be wonderful if we could find uh, some ancient Portuguese vessel there, but I don't think we will. Besides, if I know the trader, he'll be using everything off that ship for sinkers or something. But uh, this museum now has to be dismantled. I don't know whether they're sending part of it down here or not, but um, I think it'd be a great pity if these exhibits were just left to either disappear or go back to the people who donated them. Um, racking my brain now for something more historical to say about the trans guy. Um, you know, on the, the, um, the aspect of where most of the trans guy people came from, the, the whole system of early, of early history of the trans guy, it seems to me the, uh, the normal pattern of, of conquest and consolidation didn't really happen there to the extent that it happened elsewhere, because after all, I don't know, one of you has written this somewhere, the, the, uh, the imperialists were invited into this area in many respects, places like Timberland. And from that point of view, you'll find in many places there among the African tribesmen, there is not this, this uh, ingrained resentment you find elsewhere against the conqueror because it's well known and it's handed down from family to family that the white man in this particular area was, um, was out, out to rule. And that possibly accounts for areas like Timberland where you have a man like Paramount Chief Sabata who is uh, very, very free from rancor towards the white man. I don't know, it's just a theory. But possibly a man like that has, from family to family, generation to generation, been told that, uh, has not been told, that, uh, taught that the white man is an enemy but has come as a friend. I do know too that the, in all the areas where um, your, your linguists, closer linguists, have predominated, in those very same areas you have found the best um, uh, maintenance of, of law, rule, um, lack of violence, lack of assaults. You've had these assaults from time to time throughout the territories. 
And I found that in a spot like Bonvana Land, which is the most primitive, um, which I always tell, I, I get a, an amazing number of Americans visiting me in East London. And they all sent to me by Mr. Horace Byrne in Port Elizabeth. And um, they all come to me and as they tell, tell us about the trans sky, you know, and most of them know more about it than I do. In that connection, too, uh, I had a visit from an official of the Australian Embassy in Cape Town when I was down watching Parliament. And he said he wanted to take me to lunch because he wanted to learn about the trans sky. So we went, he took me to a beautiful lunch. Um, he said, well, uh, tell me something about the trans sky. So I started off very sketchily, you know, and I noticed a look of sort of uh, slight impatience across his face. I thought, well, I'm anticipating this chap by some decades, so I'd better skip a bit. And so I, I got a bit more recent, and I started talking about Emigrant Temple and Temple Land, and the Bible set up there. And he said, uh, yeah, yeah, but what I, what I would like to know is uh, what the position is today. So I said, well, uh, you know, you've got, uh, you've got Chief Kaiser Matanzima and Karamachi Porto. And uh, he had a sort of glazed look in his eye, and I said, well, now, one of Chief Porter's sons, uh, this Australian said to me, you mean Putin dumbass? I said, how did you know? He said, well, I went and visited him about two weeks ago. <laughs> and it turned out um, that through this lunch, that this, this Australian knew not only Putin dumbass, but obscure sons of the left hand and right hand house. And, um, and you know, it was almost like I'd say, you know, they'd crawl across the hill and say, yes, I know that. that that's old Joshua Quinquesi, you know. And he knew far more about the area than I do. And, and I always feel I'm a bit of a charlatan if people ask me to speak about the trans guy. Um, I don't really know all that much about it. I suppose I know more than average East London about it, but that's about as far as it goes. I do know that um, possibly what I know about it is not so bound up with the history of the place as with the, um, with the present situation there. But of course the one is very much uh, a parent of the other. And casting my mind back, I think what I've learned about the territory or the history of it, and the sketchy knowledge I have of it, doesn't come from books or, or even articles, but from uh, tribal law and folklore, and uh, what my parents and grandparents have told me. And throughout there seems um, a pattern of something that has, seems to have vanished from this country all over. I'm sure we'd find it here on the border too. And that is the caused naturally by modernization, uh, improvements of roads and mass media and newspapers, thank heavens. But uh, it was this, this ability to um, lead a fuller community life. Now there it was very strong. I am amazed today, going down there, to see bleak hillsides and vacant valleys and things where I'm told by my grandparents and parents that, that uh, gymkhanas were held there and, uh, uh, you know, tents were pitched and huge sort of rallies were held there and bands used to play. And now today, if you, you, go, you can go into the village, let alone the valleys and hills, go into the village and I don't think you'll see a sign of life after 8 o'clock. Well, it's just one of those unfortunate things, uh, I suppose, with the advent of radio which in many respects is a bit regretted. Um, you've had this tendency to, to get your entertainment canned and provided for you, and uh, you don't get the, the willingness and the ability of people to congregate together to entertain each other and themselves. But this, if, if any history of the trans guy were to be written, it could not be divorced from this aspect, and, and this aspect is bound up very strongly with the CMR days there. The, the, the CMR, the old... As a matter of fact, I addressed the old stalwarts of the CMR about a week ago, and um, many, a many an eye lighted up with the reminiscences about the trans guy. Uh, here, I feel, is, is uh, something which, here again, it's like me saying, I, as a society, I, I've always thought I should join. But here again is an aspect. I often think driving to work or lying in the bath or something, I think, you know, these old CMR chaps, they, they're not young anymore, and we, we're letting history slip by you know, without getting at them enough, talking to them enough, getting their impressions and their views of things as they were. And uh, most of them, of course, um, some of them very famous names, uh, bound up very much involved with the, the earlier history of the transcript, not the early history. And there in Umtata, Elliot Dale, Willow Vale, the most remote villages you'll find, you hear again and again from the older people, a story of a completely different community, a completely different way of life, much more vital, better organized, um, somehow more worthwhile, I think, because these men were there. And, and I always think one of the great tragedies of, of the border generally was that the CMR was ever disbanded, because they seemed to attract a particularly fine type of person and um, a fine instrumentalist. To this day, I think you meet some of the old chaps in town 
a short while ago, we have a commissioner at the Daily Dispatch called Jock Campbell. And, uh, you know, we all know Jock, but we've never given much thought to his cultural accomplishments, if any. And uh, my uh, grandfather-in-law, if I may call him so, came to see me. And uh, he took one look at old Jock Campbell and they started back and practically embraced each other like a pair of Frenchmen. And he said, do you know, this chap was the finest trumpeter in South Africa. And, and, uh, and, and uh, his predecessor was an expert on the French trombone or something. You know? and, and when you look at these chaps today, you, you know, you never believe it. And, um, and I had a practical demonstration of that a short while later. I was walking down the stairs, and um, I'm much given to whistling in my ruminant moments. And I started off um, the beginning of the Tannhauser Overture, Tannhäuser Overture. And I, and I stopped because there's one point I never know quite how to negotiate. I think a whole lot of horns come in there. And, um, and to my amazement, old Jock Campbell with a cigarette stuck in the middle of his mouth, sitting there twiddling his thumbs. And uh, he took the cigarette out and he finished the whole movement. <laughs> well, uh, I'm sorry, I've strayed a bit to the point. The point is that uh, we have walking elements of history in these old CMR chats. And I feel we should try and capture more of it, even if we could get a few of them to talk into tape recorders for a few hours, because they could tell us more. To me, history is not so much the dry facts, it's the, um, the, the more personal story behind things. The, like when we visited Miss Gately, you know? There you, you feel something which is living and interesting and something you'd, you'd almost like to turn back the time machine and be a part of. And whenever I talk to one of these old chaps, I always wish, you know, gee, I wish sometimes we could just turn the time machine back and, and see when they used to have these roaring timkanas in the Bonvana felt and bandstands in Umtata and bandstands in, in Elliota. We don't even have bandstands in East London. Huh? Um, no, I'm, I'm running out now. <laughs> Possibly I might answer some questions. That's always a good way out, isn't it? Oh, uh, yes, uh, well, yes, uh, you've got me there, I can answer half that question, um, he wasn't related, uh, he wasn't married to a relative of mine, but he, um, he named the trading station of a relative of mine in a way. He apparently was standing, you'd all know the story, and um, I don't think he actually married this person. I wouldn't have blamed him if he had, mind you, because judging by her descendants, he was quite a humdinger. But um, the, the, state, the trading station, Collie Wobbles, is uh, owned by the Cho family, uh, who are related to me by marriage. But um, they, the story goes, he saw this and said something about the river wobbling, and someone said, yes, it's Collie Wobbles. Uh, how he actually came into the picture, I don't know whether he was there on a military mission or just visiting, I really don't know. But um, I've got an interesting story to tell about that. Uh, the wife, you may possibly know it, I hope not otherwise to ruin it, but the wife of a prominent member of the Border Historical Society, I understand, uh, said to her husband not too long ago, what's all this about this, this uh, General Collie? And, uh, he said, oh, a very fine man. He said, well, I hope we don't have to have him to dinner because uh, I just don't know what I'm going to speak to him about. <laughs> Possibly someone could ask me, ask me a slightly easier question I may be able to answer. I'm really interested in what you said. You had something to say about some of these personalities, yeah. the trans guy. I think that they are, I quite agree with you that uh, that is the uh, most uh, interesting part of history. And I very much doubt if there's any other part of this country where there have been such rich and wonderful yeah, personalities yeah. as they have there. And uh, could I tell them about Jim Coe? Do you know Jim Coe? I'd rather you tell them about him. <laughs> well, I don't know very much about Jim Coe, but I can remember that as a boy of about 12, I was going up to Cape Town, uh, from Cape Town to Coxstead, my father. Uh, transfer. And we were going up there, and he told us now, when we come to Riverside, we're going to see a million there. Now, I was sitting in the middle of that before my life, and I was a god to see this million there. So we got to Riverside, and there were a great bunch of natives and others on the, uh, on the platform, and my father 
got out of the train and he mustered his luggage and so on. He was standing up there. And suddenly a figure in corduroy trousers, built to no socks, slouch hair, and he didn't have a jacket on. Came forward, he, he, he looked and his, his face looked. It was that of an educated, refined person, but really the rest of him was not in keeping. <laughs> and uh, he asked, you know, you must pay that as I'm cold. And this was a billionaire. Huh? And what a wonderful character that man was. He and his brother became subjects of Adam Carr in 1865. And I think they must have done quite a lot of trading in uh, bottles of brandy. Oh. Uh, That's one of our oldest industries. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think the, the rate of exchange is about farms of 3,000 acres for a bottle of brandy. And those, those nearly today, well, Jim Carroll owned over a tremendous portion of East Street land. And he was really the most wonderful character to have immensely wealthy. Uh, he's, he's dead now. But now there was another character I came across in connection with Jim Curl, Alec Payne. Does that name ring a bell? He really was a CMR type. A lot of planes up there. Um, yes. No E. <laughs> he, uh, he loved gambling. And in his day, the boys used to collect in the Royal Hotel in Coxstown. And there's Williams Hardware Store right outside the pub window. And pigeons sometimes used to roost on the street. <laughs> and quite often, uh, hundreds of farmers would change hands on whether it was that pigeon or this one that would take to fly like this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was down there one day when, uh, uh, when I saw a fight going on. Two of these XCA marketers and this was in the 20s, two of these CMR fellows, they had far too much to drink, and they had got into the billiard room, and they were having a dog fight under the billiard table. <laughs> and they were fighting each other, and then they couldn't see And the one who attacked was really got He was really handicapped because he had four teeth. And yes, I didn't. But they really had a terrible fight. It had to be, it, 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 they couldn't blab them. And uh, they were the most extraordinary crowd. And a friend and a friend went over to uh, the Superland over on its neck with uh, wheat and mealies. And they came back with a tremendous herd of cattle. And by the time they got to uh, the Druvich, which is really the boundary between Croxford and the Tottenham district, uh, and a friend had got tired of this. His cattle, so he said to his friend, he said, look now, I'll toss a coin for you. You take a lot, or I take a lot. And so I was in the coin, and he paid off the three months of really hard labor in the house of the city that he lost everything. <laughs> and was really happy. The famous connection with Jim Keller was that everyone else used to, uh, was terribly uh, nervous, very respectful of course, Jim Keller. Except the old Alec Payne would come rolling up to the pub and the Jim Keller was coming down the street and he'd say, Well, Jim, you won't be there. When are you going to die? <laughs> Jim Keller, he'd about in his 80s, I should say. Yes, uh, it was Stanford. Yes. 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 Stanford. Yes.